Okay, so I'm good on QRZ. Uh, it's a coincidence, K1 DMR. It's a complete coincidence, the FCC gave that to me. And uh, just randomly, I'm sorry, finished my uh, general. Um, contact me, and um, myself and two other gentlemen spent a lot of time running around the country trying to uh, preach DMR religion, and I thank them for what they do. Uh, so I've been around a little while. Uh, I tried to take the extra once, and uh, Realize I didn't study enough, and uh, I don't know if I'll get back to that or not. But did a lot in Aries races, um, been involved in DMR from the ground up, and uh, very biased, very prejudiced towards Motorola. Most of you will never buy a Motorola radio, don't worry about it. Um, all digital is good. So there's a tendency, and I was talking to John Davis earlier, maybe it's a human being thing, that you always have to put something else down if it's not the thing that you're on. Um, I think you can love all the digital modes, Fusion, D-Star, you don't have to bash the others, right? All digital is good. I think if you found digital, you can bash analog. That was a joke. <laughs> okay. All right, so uh, I'm going to go really quick. Fire hose. I once did, I used to work at Gunner, I used to chase terrorists, that was a waste of time, nobody really cares about terrorism, that's another story. And uh, they don't, there's no political will to deal with terrorism in the world. Why? Because they come after you and they get mad. So I went to some training for CIA, and a uh, guy comes up to me, he says, oh my God. I says, oh jeez, was it that bad? And you were like, a fire hose, we love it. <laughs> okay, so here we go. Uh, so, uh, oh, how many of you uh, uh, know what DMR is? Uh, how many are using DMR now? Okay. Uh, how many are just getting into DMR? Okay, that's good, that's good, that's good. Um, this very similar presentation I've done, I apologize. There's a lot of information, so if you've seen it before, you will pick up some other stuff. Um, okay, so DMR, digital mobile radio, uh, as compared to LMR, which is a traditional uh, analog radio. So it's a worldwide standard. Um, it's not proprietary in any way. And it has a tendency to be the commercial standard as compared to what the public safety standard is, which is P25. P25 does really nothing more than DMR does, except there's a certifying body that says if you're law enforcement, you must have P25. And by the way, coincidentally, it's three times as much. Just a coincidence. But you have to have it, you have to have it. So the other great thing is it's not uh, tied to any one manufacturer. Hams are hysterical about that. I think that's wrong. Um, it doesn't matter if it's tied to one manufacturer. Uh, if you have a hang up on that, you'll love this because there's 30 now, okay? So there's a certifying body, an organization uh, that certifies the standards. Any manufacturer can join that organization and make the radios. So why, what's the big deal about DMR? What's the big deal? Who cares about this? Why, why is it such a big deal? Here you go. I'm not gonna repeat everything. I have time, just kind of look at it. Longer battery life, 40% more because of the way it works, and I'll show you that in a minute. Automatic roaming, I don't preach that a lot. There are guys that do roaming in Atlanta. They really like it, it works well. It doesn't work as well as it should uh, because it, there's a lot of infrastructure that needs to go on, but you know that's kind of cool. Uh, and you can do all sorts of things with it, including forgetting to turn off my uh, Oh, I did, you did. Okay, and then it's the largest application, uh, the largest application development program of any two-way radio program in the history of the world. That should tell you something. So this is used all over the world. It's a worldwide standard. It's the gold standard. It's used by more people around the world than anything else. Commercial, business, police, fire. It's it's significant, and and it's so pervasive. You can actually say that about it there. So there's three standards in a DMR standard. I'm not going to bore you. We used tier two. Tier three is coming where it's going to allow um, trunking, but tier two is what we use, uh, what amateurs use, uh, and that's the current uh, standard used here in the US for the most part. I'm not going to bore you with this. So it's 12 and a half spacing instead of 25, and there's a protocol that allows you to connect repeaters. Okay, 
So here's a visual picture. I, I'm a visual learner, uh, especially you know when, when Playboy comes in the mail. I'm a visual learner. Um, so um, there you can see uh, what the differences are. So not only is it more narrow, the bandwidth is narrow, but it allows two channels, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So it's not only efficient, spectrum efficient, it's efficient in, a, in, a, in and of itself because it provides two channels instead of one. That's technical stuff. I don't even know what that means. Um, okay, so here's an example. If you look at the top, there's a traditional uh, 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 analog system. You have to have two repeaters. You have to have a combiner. You have to have two frequencies. TDMA, uh, time division multiplex, you are actually slicing and dicing and interspersing simultaneously the two channels. It's, it's very important because you're getting twice the bang for the buck. Um, and it's significant. You have to buy two repeaters, a combiner, two antennas, all that stuff. Okay. Normally the way it's intended is slot one or time slot one would be voice and time slot two would be GPS or data. Um, hams like to talk. You hadn't heard that? And uh, so we've decided we're just going to use two slots for voice. So you can do text messaging, all sorts of stuff with it. So this is great. A lot of people can't get their heads around this because a lot of guys will tell you that they can, they can actually prove to you scientifically in their own minds, scientifically in their own minds, there's a catch there, um, that analog is better, that you can hear analog further. All the studies in the world have shown that's complete nonsense. Your mind will tell you that you think you can hear analog better, further, but you can't. Digital will drop off, there's no question. At one point, digital will stop. But you'll be able to hear digital clearer, farther, than you will analog. And uh, there's all sorts of statistical studies on that, if you want to read up on it. And then, it's pure audio. That's what's important about it. It's pure audio, so it's more spectrum efficient. Um, it, it's... Uh, Better audio quality, no hiss, popping, static, and and uh, it's going to give you 25% more range, along with 40% more uh, for battery. So the biggest thing in DMR over say D Star, we'll talk about it a little bit, is it, it it came up with an improved vocoder. It uses an improved vocoder, and so the quality is much better. You don't get the R2D2 that you would get in D Star. A lot of guys like it for that reason. And we'll talk about there's some things D-Star does that's just far superior for an amateur, and it is what it is. What happened was, this is not an amateur standard. This is a commercial standard that amateur radio operators said, you know what, I want a more robust radio, and I want a more robust protocol. So I want to drop the radio and not have it break. I want to get more than a half a watt of audio out of the radio. I want the radio to perform really well. And so amateurs, found DMR and said, you know what? We're going to make a network out of this for amateur radio. So it's the other way around. It wasn't somebody saying we want an amateur standard for amateurs. This is a commercial standard. The amateur said we want better equipment. As a part of that, you're going to get a radio, for the most part, that's NTIA specs. What is that? It's not a splatter radio. Okay? We'll talk about that a little bit. So right here. All of the amateur equipment don't meet NTIA specs. So if you do Aries Racings, you do Coast Guard Auxiliary, you do Civil Air Patrol, you've done all of them, you're not allowed to, you're not allowed to use those radios because they don't conform to the standards and they cause problems and they're splattered. So just understand, uh, if you're going to do it, understand there's, there's an issue with it. So here's some of the manufacturers, there's, there's a lot more now, it just keeps growing and growing, everybody's on the bandwagon. We've seen even Kenwood now uh, realize that, well, maybe we went off on the wrong track with Nexten, and so now Kenwood is coming out with DMR. It, it shows you a lot if specific manufacturers are changing protocols and moving to DMR after they were tied to their own proprietary protocol. It tells you that they missed the boat and they're trying to get on the bandwagon. So here's just some terminology. Code plug is just the memory in the radio. <coughs> Software is what drives that. A talk group is like a channel. A zone is a group of channels or talk groups. Scan group is a list that you scan through. Talk around the same as simplex. Channels the same. Contacts would be each individual radio ID. 
A color code is like a PL tone for a repeater, but in digital language. And a C-bridge is a device that can be used to connect repeaters. Uh, don't worry about this. Uh, I'll be out on the DMR table. Uh, if you've got questions, you can ask questions here at the end. I'm going to try and flip through this. But if you've got any questions, write them down. Come to me at the table, especially if you want something a little bit more in depth. So there's two types of talk groups or two types of uh, channels or, or talk paths. Some of those are full time, meaning they're on the repeater, always on. And some are user on demand or user accessible. Okay, which means you key it up and the talk group would be open for about 15 minutes. Uh, and then after 15 minutes, if there's no activity, it closes. Most repeaters have 30 talk groups, and the only way you can manage that is doing a mixture of those two, on demand or full time. So I guess it's probably 12 years ago now, I missed updating that. Um, it's the fastest growing thing in the hobby and has been for a number of years. Doesn't seem to be slowing down. Um, it, is, it is what it is, I'm not going to bore you with the numbers. So let's talk about, well, Ken, why are we here about, D, uh, D, sir, why are we here about DMR? And, and, then, and then you're going to say to yourself, well, I don't understand. What's Fusion? What's, what's uh, Next Dead and IDIS? How does this all fit in with DSTAR? And this is stuff that I've gotten from research. I try not to talk my own personal opinions. I don't feel it's responsible. I feel anything I say should be backed up by factual <laughs> research. So DSTAR, if you want a purpose-built amateur radio protocol, there's nothing more flexible and more powerful than DSTAR. The problem is, for some people, it's tied to manufacturers, although that's just recently opened up. So it's a semi-closed protocol. And the vocoder um, does, isn't the, the, the plus two. I wish they would have done that. Uh, but the, the head of uh, ICOM in Japan, the, the gentleman, I forget his name, he's personally decided that they just don't want to do that. Um, so pluses and minuses and all these. Next then at IDIS, uh, for some reason, it just never took off. It's very manufacturer specific. Uh, that's Kenwood and Iden's, um, that's Kenwood and Icon's commercial uh, version. Fusion, I don't know. There's some guys that really love Yezu. Um, I like some of the features of some of their radios, um, but it was too little too late. So by the time uh, Yezu got on the DMR bandwagon, or the digital bandwagon, I'm sorry, um, uh, it has the best audio quality. But it was manufacturer specific, and a lot of people were concerned about that with D-Star and ICOM. So they did the same thing, saying, don't buy ICOM, buy Yezu. And, and that, I think, they didn't learn anything. And then uh, it didn't really take off. Um, part of uh, why it did take off to the extent that it did is that Yezu said, for $500, we're going to give you a repeater. The problem is the repeater is so bad, it desenses itself. Um, and so uh, that never worked out from a repeater performance issue. Then the other thing is they had their internet connectivity called wires, and for several years it never worked. So too little, too late, and it's, it's sad um, because it is phase one P25 CFM, very good audio quality, but it just it just never took off and for those reasons. And then phase P25 phase two, open up your wallet, which is not for hams, I don't think, in my opinion. Uh, you can look at a, an all-band uh, phase 22 uh, radio. Retails about twelve thousand um, dollars. You, you know, most departments buy them for seven thousand, eight thousand uh, dollars. You can get some older Motorola stuff for less than a grand, but it's big bucks, and I just don't see that um, happening with amateur radio for that reason. These charts. I'm going to go through this real quickly. Uh, uh, that's all. These charts is going to show you that DMR is not proprietary. DMR has a better standard for for the most part. Um, and it's just going to show you what the adoption rate is, okay? So most of this on Fusion is analog. So a, a thing that Yezu didn't understand is, yeah, we'll sell them a repeater for $500. We'll hook them, okay? But the problem is hams aren't stupid. I don't want digital. I don't need digital. We're going to buy the $500 repeater. I'm going to run it in analog. Screw you, <laughs> okay? So bad, bad move. Uh, it didn't work for them. Um, and you look at, at, at DMR in terms of how it's growing, it surpassed D-Star in the summer of last year in terms of growth rate, adoption rate, and so forth. And it's just been a big thing, and it just it just keeps coming. It's not like the VHFs and Beta Wars. Uh, we're not really sure, you know, that kind of thing. But it, it's, a, it's a clear trend, and it doesn't seem to be going away. 
Uh, we're on 900. I know some of you are crazy about 900. Some of you in Atlanta have 900 repeaters. That's all great. Um, I think you do it to get away from other people, uh, and that's okay. That can be legitimate to some extent. Um, but the reality is Wi-Fi is coming to 900. There's all sorts of other stuff coming. There's all sorts of technical reasons why you would stay away from 900. Um, so just, just to warn you about that. We'll talk about why DMR is mostly on UHF, but I want to make a note about that. So, uh, yeah, just growing. So there's a couple different networks. Uh, most of it was established from the very beginning by a group of Motorola aficionados and engineers uh, that started with Motorola Backbone. That's the most prevalent. Um, Hytera uh, ended up uh, starting to copy Motorola and, and producing some repeaters. Never really took off as well. People who hate Motorola will use Hytera repeaters. Um, and then there's a third network that's uh, uh, network that's agnostic. Uh, can use both Motorola or Hytera repeaters. It's called Brandmeister. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So if you've got a club and you want to say, well, what should we do? You want to look at these three things. Each network has its own cultural usage and reliability, and you have to weigh them. For example, Brandmeister would do a lot of neat things. A lot of people are crazy about Brandmeister, but the reliability is poor. Um, so I respect the fact that you like Brandmeister, but you can't make me like Brandmeister. Um, so I'm a repeater owner. I spent $15,000 on putting up repeater sites commercial grade repeater sites, and I want the best audio. I don't want noisy hotspots. I don't want poor quality. Respect that. I'm the owner. I'm the one that put up the equipment. I'm allowing you to use it. Respect the fact that I should be able to enjoy what I put up. So it shouldn't be bashing between networks as there shouldn't be bashing between D-Star and DMR and Fusion. So, so understand that. The Motorola network is more reliable, more sound, but it's also very strict about what they allow and what they don't allow. Um, so each of them has differences, and you can talk to me later about that. Uh, you know, offline or you go to the whole conversation about philosophically where you want to be. So here's the original network. It was called Motorola Amateur Radio Club. They started the original network. Um, and there's resources here and at the table where you can get that. Um, basically, this is the way it works is that you have a bunch of uh, master repeaters and their peers that spin off of those and there's bridging hardware that allows these repeaters to talk to each other. So the network would be where the bridging hardware is, okay, um, whether it be Brandmeister or uh, the uh, traditional network. So here's one of the devices that most people use in a traditional network, it's called a Seabridge. Not a big deal, it just allows you to connect the repeaters. That. Here's Brandmeister's website information. You can come get it from me at the table. Um, uh, here's what they do. Uh, not a professional network per se, uh, private servers. The traditional network is in professional server farms with loading requirements and all sorts of other stuff. There's a the big difference between the two. Again, more flexibility here, but not as reliable. And the quality gets uh, threatened, I think, because they're more flexible what they allow. A lot of guys are making their own homebrew repeaters, and not always are they uh, to such audio standards that, that it uh, uh, is effective. Okay. So uh, this has changed quite a bit. Um, uh, I was involved in putting up the five high sites here in Atlanta. There's seven now, or eight now, or nine now. Um, the point of this story is uh, you can go anywhere in Atlanta and you really don't need to use a hotspot. You should be in an RF pathway for the most part. We'll talk about the advantages of hotspots and some of the pros and cons. Uh, yeah, so anyways, here's the different repeaters. There's a thousand, there's a hundred watt repeater, 50 watt repeaters, there's portable repeaters. Hytera makes a couple, portable, high and low power. Uh, and then a lot of guys are doing this stuff. There's some really bright guys in Atlanta that are making their own repeaters from analog radios and patching them together with boards. This is the essence of amateur radio and experimentation. Um, so this is a wide open field if you want to get into that. Um, so some of you are saying, well, what should we do? Uh, you know, what are my choices? Where do I start? So most of DMR in the United States is 95% is on 440. Um, 
Yeah, can anybody tell me why it's not on VHF? Well, there was a recent VHF repeater added in Atlanta. Can anybody tell me why? Huh? Not enough frequency pairs. It's just it's just mother nature, right? Um, and the other thing is, can anybody tell me why there's two areas in the country that are solely VHF and not UHF? Why does that happen? Too I just like to do this to keep you awake. Too close to the border. Okay. Um, pay Paul radar. Looking for intercontinental ballistic missiles coming into the United States. Although Vladimir is Trump's best friend, uh, uh, Putin, uh, Trump, so we don't have to worry about that, right? Um, so uh, pay Paul radar in New England and in Northern California works at 430 or so. And uh, so you cannot use UHF in those places. So that's where VHF is king. But other than that, because of the sheer necessity of finding pairs, most of it is on UHF. So in buying equipment, new or used, you're going to do VHF, UHF 900. If most of what you have is UHF, you're going to think about that. Do you get free programming software, free programming cable? How many channels do you want display, non-display? All these things, if they're important to you. Do you want GPS, you know, Bluetooth, whatever. And when you're buying equipment, do you want it to last after you dropped it one time? Uh, do you care that you do Aries races and you want to be able to have a radio that meets the specs? Um, do, do you want to open up a new radio and not have a dead radio or dead battery? Um, so there's a lot of bashing that goes on about this. I will tell you that when I first got involved in helping him get a DMR, I sold the heck out of Chinese radios. Um, why? Because I'm a drug dealer. Right? Does anybody know what that means? Right? You're not going to buy a four or five or six hundred dollar motor radio to try a DMR, but you'll say, "Hey, I might try it for 150 bucks." Right? So my thing was, I don't care. I'll sell anything that you want, uh, but I'll get you hooked on DMR, and then you come back to me a year later. Wow, man, I really love this DMR. You know, I want to get a real radio now. You know, so nothing wrong with them. But just understand, there's some limitations with them. And, and it's helped DMR in a sense that it's grown the growth, but it's also hurt DMR in a sense that a lot of people have not really done what they should have done and getting them up to speed, making sure the audio is good. And so it's hurt DMR in a way. But like anything else in life, it's good and bad. Um, and we've seen in the Hytera case, and there are other cases coming, including class action suits against Hytera. Understand, and I realize it's not going to change anything in the room, and it's not politically correct, but understand when you're buying the Chinese knockoffs or the clones, um, inadvertently you're, you're supporting the theft of USIP for the most part. I mean, it's been established. So uh, just, just keep that in mind. I'm not saying don't buy Chinese radios. I'm saying it's a great place to start and it's a great radio for the price. Nobody can dispute that. Okay, so we don't have time for this, but basically check with your buds. Um, there are some better than others, but there's some really inexpensive radios, 100 bucks or less, okay? A little bit more, a little bit better quality. The U.S. manufacturers have a tendency to have better support. There really isn't any support, most of the Chinese stuff. Um, uh, and again, still very affordable. Good place to start, get involved. You can always upgrade if you want. Different stuff here, I'm not gonna bore you. You can buy some older Motorola equipment if you don't like the price point of Motorola. Um, there's some great stuff running around. I got guys buying these for 250 bucks all day on eBay. I mean, you know, so, uh, hand fest recently in Stone Mountain, there was a guy that had a whole bunch of those for 200 bucks. So, you know, there's options, okay? Motorola is a professional uh, platform. It's gonna require the payment of software. Your club should be able to help you so you don't have to buy the software. Just understand, uh, Motorola is not gonna give you the software free. It's not gonna give you a program to cable free. Um, that's something other manufacturers do and it's not, it's not typical. Bunch of other uh, types of uh, uh, manufacturers and different types of models. I'm not going to bore you with it. Um, there's actually uh, Kenwood has started to combine DMR and P25 in a radio. We've had a lot of issues with it. We haven't been able to get it to work. Uh, when you start mixing protocols, uh, there's issues. Uh, but at the end of the day, it is there if you decide you want to go that way. We do see that potentially coming with other manufacturers that you might be able to get more protocols in one radio, like P25 and DMR, for example. So let's go about the hotspots. Different flavors of hotspots, not gonna bore you this, not gonna spend a lot of time on it. This is one of the first ones that came out. 
Lots of audio issues with this, and they're still banned on some networks just because it, it's such poor quality. They've done a huge job of getting a much better, but the point I'm trying to make to you is not all hotspots are alike, or not all of them are equal, okay? It's a little bit better well-known one, comes out of the UK, Gus does a good job of this. Uh, these guys probably had the best hotspot around, I think, still to this day. It's a standalone device, doesn't require images and SD cards, and doesn't require all that stuff that creates instability. Um, they've upgraded it to a new and improved version, and like anything else, you go into the grocery store and your favorite soap is now new and improved. Guess what? The other one was better. Mm -hmm. So the new hotspot uh, has less power requirements, uh, but to do that, and smaller size, but to do that, they had to cut corners. So the Wi-Fi isn't as long range, other issues with connectivity and whatever, but um, so new and improved is not always it, but still very affordable. And we'll talk about what the advantages of hotspots are. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say you shouldn't do it. Uh, in some cases, it's the only option for some people. Um, I live on the Georgia, North Carolina border. I don't have an RF pathway where I am. And for the most part, uh, for most of my DMR career, I was using hotspots. This is a little bit upgrade where they're putting multiple protocols, a little bit more expensive, better quality. Um, you get what you pay for. Um, these guys, um, some decent stuff, uh, but they've got some issues with it being off frequency. Uh, and, uh, and there's a way to resolve that. So just understand that, that uh, don't put them, get them out of the box, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Just don't get them out of the box and turn them on. You need to do a little bit more. Uh, this guy is getting more higher end stuff, a um, little bit better quality chips and so forth, and we'll talk about that. So you want to get involved in DMR, what do you do? How do you get started? First thing you got to do is go and get a radio ID. And you can go to that website here, come to the table, I'll give you the link to it, so on and so forth. You should get about two IDs. They don't want to encourage you to get two more, because, uh, too many because it's growing so fast, I can't keep up with it. And don't run both radios on the same ID at the same time. It makes people upset when they see that. Don't make up your own ID. It makes people upset when they see that. If you keep doing that, or if people keep doing that, they're gonna shut this down and, and require a whole bunch of paperwork before they give you an ID, and I don't think this is a good thing for anybody. Some of you have said to me just this morning, hey, I'm really challenged, I don't understand, I can't get my head around uh, DMR. Yes, it's a, it's a little bit more, but it's not uh, hugely more and not hugely uh, confusing uh, if you really break it down. So if you're programming an analog frequency, you're gonna have three things, right? You're gonna have a transmit frequency, a receive frequency, and you're gonna have maybe a PL tone. So digital only requires two pieces of information more than that, okay? Because remember I said the color code acts like a, a PL tone, right? So it's only gonna have two more pieces of information, a time slot, and guess what? You only have two choices, one or two. And then you're only gonna have talk groups, lots of choices there, but you only have one other piece, talk groups. Not, not impossible if you think about it, just two extra pieces of information. Since you're doing digital on TDMA, you're gonna be using narrowband FM, right? 12.5, uh, so that's a little bit different uh, than uh, wideband or 25, so just understand that there's differences there. Okay, so to finish up on this part of the presentation, with more of the general presentation, we'll go into best practice here in a minute. One minute over. Um, is what's the story with DMR? What's the bottom line? Well, very high adoption rate and it continues to grow. Superior audio quality. A lot of people want the better audio quality. It's hard for me to go back and use analog when I'm at home because that's the only thing that's there just because it's snap, crackle, and pop and it, it, it's, it's, uh, it gets frustrating after a while. You get spoiled. It's like flying first class. It's really hard to go back to coach. It's a commercially robust platform. The gear is commercial grades. It's better quality audio, better quality battery life, so on and so forth. Fraction of the cost of P25. And, uh, and remember, one of the advantages of P25 over DMR is it, it, it offers encryption. And there is two levels of encryption with DMR. It's just not as strong. Um, but don't get crazy over that because it's, it's illegal to use encryption on amateur radio anyways. I know you all do. I got that. Um, okay. Talk groups. One of the reasons why I think DMR has been more popular is because of talk groups. So with D-Star, you've got to put routing repeater and 
destination repeater and gateway and all this stuff. Talk group, if you want to talk to somebody in North America, you put in North America. You want to talk to somebody in Brazil, you put in Brazil. You want to talk to somebody in Southern US, US you put that in. It's, 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 it's tied to a geography, a subject, or a language, and it's easier just to know where to go and, and simple one segment of information you put in, you're done. I think people like the more because of that. Somebody had a comment. Somebody had a comment or somebody say something. Okay, so uh, the other thing I like about it is it's got short QSOs for the most part, right? When you're on Brandmeister World 991, I like to hang out there. You get on, how's the report? How's the weather? Where are you? That's cool, and you get off. Why? Because you're tying up a lot of repeaters around the world, and so you're sensitive about that. I like that aspect of it. There are talk groups in DMR. Um, John Burningham refers to TAC 310 as channel 19. Does anyone know what that reference is? Okay, so if you want to go on there and talk about, you know, forever for hours, um, you can do that. Um, so I'm not saying you have to all have short QSOs. I'm saying this is, I think, one of the draws for a lot of people is it, it's, it's more technical oriented, uh, uh, shorter, uh, more professional for the most part in the majority of talk groups. Spectrum efficient. This is something we do as good stewards of amateur radio, right? We're trying to save our bandwidth. We're trying to save amateur radio and we're trying to justify it, and the more efficient we can be makes the regulators happy and, and ultimately gives us more opportunities for more repeaters and more people, and so this is a good thing. Not tied to manufacturers, I've talked about it, and there's a lot of nice features besides the range uh, and the battery life, such as automatic roaming. The repeaters, for the most part, are plug and play, just a couple minutes uh, uh, out, out of the box. Uh, it's not, not, not you know years to put it together. Um, and I like the fact that Especially HF in the last few years has been very challenging. Uh, and clearly when the SHTF, or however that phrase is, you probably you want HF to some extent because you don't need any infrastructure if you're really talking about serious emergency communications. But if you're talking about a fun hobby, I don't have to have a huge long wire in my house. I don't have to have a one kilowatt linear. I don't have to wait for the solar flares. I don't have to wait for the right moment in time when I might be able to talk to somebody. I key up. I'm talking to somebody around the world and it's pure audio. Uh, is that real radio? I don't want to get into the debate of that. I just find it's enjoyable. Okay, this is supposed to be a hobby. All right, okay. Please spread the word. It's supposed to be a hobby, you're supposed to have fun. Okay, status of analog. Um, it's dying. In the last couple of years, most commercial manufacturers stopped making analog only equipment. The end is near. Uh, you can still hang on to it if you want. Uh, you know, bring your gun, my cold dead hands. Whatever, uh, the reality is it's not efficient, it's, it's just going away. There's no reason to be involved in analog anymore, to be honest with you, from a technical standpoint. So better networks, uh, internet connectivity, which is good redundancy. And where I live in the mountains of North Carolina, uh, you can get better reliability from internet connectivity than you can for electricity, right? So I lived in an island in the Caribbean for years, okay? We made our own power there, we made our own water. We had to desalinate the water. Okay, my power went off in the islands less than it does here in North Carolina. Okay, Blue Ridge EMC, that's a plug for them. Um, uh, so, so what I'm telling you is, you're saying, oh, Ken, you've got a weakness here because you're relying on the internet. I'm telling you that the internet, uh, which by the way is a direct fiber connection to the backbone of Atlanta, where I live, is more reliable than internet, uh, than uh, electricity. Uh, the area where I live was the last place in the United States to get electricity in people's homes in the early 40s. Okay, so just because you're tied to the internet, it's not a bad thing. Uh, come to the booth. Uh, I'll give you all these resources, tell you where to go. Okay, quick questions uh, on some of the general stuff of DMR. This guy listened to every word I said. Every word I said in the last 33 minutes, he listened to every single word. What's the advantage to having two IDs if you've got multiple radios, but you're the only operator, is it really necessary? Um, no, if you're not gonna have them on at the same time. But the reason why some people do, I don't know that thought. The reason why some people do two IDs is because they have a portable and they have a mobile, and they want to kind of distinguish them. But for the most part, if you're not running them at the same time, meaning the network administrators don't see you having a conversation with yourself, 
All right, that's an alarm, right? Um, so um, I don't think there's any reason to, but a lot of guys get says, oh, I want 12. Well, why would you really need 12? That's the point, you got it. Um, so a lot of hams are lazy, don't want to find out that you got to get a, 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 an ID. So guess what they do? Imaginative hams that we are, we program in radio ID number one. Brilliant, right? So the network administrators spam that out. So guess what? The one radio ID that's, in ban that's banned on all networks around the world, radio ID number one, right? Why? We don't want you doing that. Don't do that. Don't do that. Okay, any other questions? Surely there must have been more than one question, and don't call me Shirley. Yes? Um, in this presentation, and at your conclusion, I've seen icons in the logo there and the radio out there, but what is their connection to DMR? ICOM has no connection to DMR whatsoever. I got up at five o'clock in the morning, drove three hours, paying for this all out of my time and expense. I had a surplus ICOM radio and I decided if I'm gonna sit here all day doing this on my dime, I'm gonna put it on a table, to see if you guys wanna take advantage of it. Other than that, ICOM has no connection with DMR. I also got a Kenwood radio for sale on my table. Um, you know, they're both open box, warranty. Uh, no connection to DMR. It's just, I'm sitting here, there's a bunch of hams. Uh, you know, I figured it'd be appropriate to bring ham radio equipment to a place like this rather than, uh, you know, radio control cars or something. Uh, good question. I'm not trying to give you a hard time, but that might have been confusing. I thought about that. I thought about not putting them on the table, not bringing them for that reason. So uh, I made a mistake. Yes? Yeah, I had a, a best practices question. Yeah. If, if you hook up with somebody on Tag 310 or North America or wherever. Are you married? And you decide, <laughs> and you decide you want to carry on a rack tube. Right. And you want to do it somewhere else. Right. How, how do you agree where you're going to go? Okay. Is that something you have to kind of program in uh, ad hoc maybe? Or yeah. So that's a great question. That's probably one of the most preeminent challenges and questions of the day. I will cover that, but since you're so kind to bring it up now, we'll talk about it now. So Carter in Hawaii has done some statistical analysis on the network. And we monitor this because we want to know how people are using DMR. And uh, next week I'll publish on the Facebook group or the Yahoo group the most commonly used talk groups in DMR. Because I think people, the second problem with DMR is there's too many talk groups. I think people want to know where people are, are talking. The problem is there's too many talk groups that are really spread to the wind and nobody can find anybody. But the reference to your question is if you do hook up with somebody, whether you're married or single or boyfriend, girlfriend, whoever, um, if it's not a rag chew channel, if the purpose of the talk group is not rag chew, then you want to move off somewhere. We'll talk about that for a minute. So we had a couple guys come to the barbecue lunches. We have a couple lunches a week here in Atlanta where you can get together and learn how to program, talk to like-minded people. And there was a guy that came to the lunch and it was reported to me immediately. Somebody went to the best room and called me on the cell phone and said the guy got on this talk group and he admitted at the lunch that he didn't even know what the talk group was for. Um, don't do that. Don't do that. If you're not sure what the purpose of the talk group is, don't do that. What am I talking about? I heard guys on Brandmeister World 991, both in the United States, both in the same state. Is that the appropriate use of Brandmeister Brand World 991? Probably not. It's meant for international contacts, right? They were talking about power supplies for 45 minutes, <laughs> tying up the worldwide network. So what they do is they should have gone to state right Arizona, gone to a chat channel on that and had all the conversation they wanted. So make sure you're using the talk groups appropriately. So now I just covered three points on this other presentation. To get back to, to your thing, what you should do is program in your radio, in my opinion, somebody else, you tell me if you have a better idea. You program in your radio some contingencies. So let's talk about this. So in the radios I use, I program TAC 310, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19. I programmed a couple others, but I did that in the hopes that if I find you and you want to rag chew and we're not on a rag chew channel, say we're on North America. Does anybody know how many repeaters are in North America? When you key up on North America Talk Group 3, does anybody know how many repeaters you're keying up? I shrug your shoulders. I like that. It's honest. It's honest. About 2,000, right? So Carter has done some statistical analysis where he found a guy in Arizona talking to another guy in Arizona in the same town, covered by the same repeater, 
talking on North America. Is that an efficient use of resources? Probably not. Probably not. So what you do is, if you find somebody and you want to talk to them more at length and you're not on a Rag Chew channel, program some contingencies in your radio so you're already prepared to go. So, so you can say to them, hey, do you want a QSY? What did you have to QSY? Do you have 310, 311, 319? Do you have Georgia statewide? Use something that you have in there as a fallback. But you don't want to have a QSO with someone say, hey, let's go somewhere, and then not have something programmed in there, because otherwise it's impolite, hey, Johnny, give me 30 minutes, i got to program my radio, and I'll get back to you. So that's what I suggest. Does any, I'm not always the expert. I don't always have all the answers. Has anybody found anything better than that? Is anybody doing anything different than that? I don't know if there is a way, uh, but that's what you should do. Put enough places that you can go to and you hope that that guy has done the same thing, because the only way it works is this way. Hang, hang on that thought. So I have a father in Las Vegas and a son in New Jersey, and they couldn't figure out how to talk to each other. And what I told them to do was, go to the repeaters in your area, Las Vegas, go to the repeaters in Trenton, New Jersey, go to the network administrator, go to the repeater owner, go to the repeater website, send each other a copy of all the talk groups that are enabled on the Trenton, New Jersey repeater, and then the Las Vegas repeater, find a talk group in common. Once you've identified a talk group in common, program it for both of yours, Bob's your uncle, you're done. Yes? Yeah, can you program in an individual's uh, digital ID and make a private call to you? Uh, you can, so, um, but there's rules about that. Same thing with roaming and so forth. So when you, um, so let's talk about this. You have two time slots, right? So when you initiate a private call, some networks allow it. Brandmeister will allow it, for example, I believe. Um, the other networks do not. And the reason for that is, when you initiate a private call with an individual, you're tying up that time slot. No one else in the world can use that time slot on those machines. So it's very resource intensive, and generally that's discouraged. You could do that, but it's generally discouraged because it's very inefficient uh, doing it that way. That's all. But that's fun to do. I like the private call caller. I do. I do. Yes? Is there a website anywhere for repository for code flows? Like, mm -hmm. if I wanted a specific one for a specific radio? Yeah, so where does Jeff? Did you just Jeff step out? I was talking bad about high terror, so Jeff probably got pissed off and left. Yeah, no, I'm just kidding. He's a nice guy. Uh, so, uh, Jeff brought this up, and he said, well, it's the same question. Well, why isn't there a centralized knowledge base for DMR that's so popular and so fast is growing, fast is the problem, um, why can't we go to one place and get everything we want? Well, no time and money, <laughs> okay? So there isn't right now. Um, and I thought about doing it five years ago, I think about doing it every day. And I was running the Q&A net here in Atlanta and I never got any help. So right now, there's just not enough resources to do it. If you're looking for the next best thing, there's a Facebook group and a Yahoo group for Atlanta Metro. You can get on those groups. I have a strong suspicion that if you apply to join those groups, what's your name? Uh, Chuck. I have a strong suspicion that Chuck, if you apply for those groups, that you will be immediately approved. Um, you can get on those groups and there's some code plugs on, on file there. And you can also ask, hey, I got a Radio Diddy RG77F, little E. Can you help me with that? You know, does anybody have a code plus? That's the next best thing you could do. If you come by the table, I'll give you a, a link where you can go get those links, join those groups, and Chuck, you will be approved as that, well, 2.30. Let me get out of here first. <laughs> uh, I'll pull over to the hot spot and do it. Yes? Right now, I can use a Node ID on a standard analog, so I could go into this example, the uh, GARS repeater and dial a Node ID in any up to any other node someplace, and I would have a direct channel, so I wouldn't tie up only two repeaters. It would only be the two repeaters that I've tied up. Can I do that in DMR? Yes, so that's a good question. So each repeater will have a local talk group that's only tying up that repeater. You're not going to 1,700 repeaters in North America, or 2,000 other repeaters in North America. Usually it's local two or local nine. Um, there's a talk group where you can just talk on the local repeater yourself. 
You want to hear something really funny? We've got this really robust network that talks all around the world. Does anybody know how the majority of hams use DMR? Does anybody know? Statistically, looking at the analysis, 85% of you choose to use it locally only. 85% of you still hanging on to analog, still hanging on to static single site repeaters. That's how you choose to use it. You're using local two or local nine. You don't want to talk to somebody outside of your area. Does anybody know why? Does anybody know why? I like to talk to Brazilian women late at night. I do. But the reason why is because you got something more in common with somebody. You want to bitch about Atlanta traffic, right? Okay. By the way, if I hear another conversation about that, I, I swear I'm going to get on the radio. I say, I got the money ahead. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Okay. Uh, I know you had a question, uh, but 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 hang on because you've been really patient. I'm going to take advantage of you a little longer. Yes. Well, I I just. That's why I forgot you. I'm just barely getting into this. Just helping me a lot. God bless you. But I talked to a guy in New York. I'm from New York. I hit him on the repeater. I made me a little Omni for 440. Uh huh. Hung it up to the. Uh, this is to keep you guys busy. Go ahead. Yeah. That's what DMR I'm interested in. Let me talk to Germany where I got family. Let me talk. I can tell you that you're in the minority. You're in the 15%. Everybody else wants to talk to people that just look like them. And if you look like me, I don't see the point in that. Okay? I want to get the Brazilian, you know, chick, okay? So, um, but there are a lot of people that have friends or relatives or they have family connections to Germany and, and, and they enjoy that more. I like being on a Worldwide 91 because I like getting the guy in Malta. There's three licensed amateur radios and amateur radio operators in Malta. I love Hearing a guy from Malta, he tells me it's 120 degrees and it's shady, and you know I love I, I love that. So to me that's more interesting. I've traveled around the world, been around the world eight million times, eight million miles, eight times, and so you know what I'm, I'm in like that. But this is something that's good about DMR. It's good for everyone. Okay, one more question. I'm going to go back to him because he's been patient. So, so I understand. Yes. I can't go any place other than what is programmed by right. by the repeater owner, and he set up his talk groups in that repeater. Right. Okay. Uh, okay, so say that first part again. The repeater owner will set up his repeater talk groups. His talk Hopefully groups. the repeater owner does a good job of publishing them so you know what ones there are. But if We've been one, a little deficit in that. But if there's, one in, if there's not one in there that I want to go to, like Alaska as an example, right. I'm not going, right? Well, here's what you do. you got two avenues. You can call a repeater owner and say, listen, I'd really like to talk to some friends in Alaska. Would you consider adding the talk group? Okay. That's one way. Remember, the biggest problem with DMR is got too many talk groups, right? So, would it be would it be fair if I tie up a time slot to put an Alaska talk group just for you to talk to your, I mean, God bless her, your sister, your daughter? I mean, so that's really for two people. Now we're tying up, for, you know. So that's some of the problems with DMR. So we have to be sensitive about that. But there's no reason why you couldn't ask the repeater owner, uh, you know. So I created the Atlanta Metro Talk Group. How I did it. Ask. Communication is the key. I called John Birmingham. I waited until 2 o'clock in the morning. I know he's a night owl. I knew he had probably a couple drinks. I called him and said, hey, what do you think about this? Yeah, yeah, sure, whatever. Okay? And then it was history. And then, you know, now I sometimes think I made a mistake. Yes? My question's really low level. 99% <clears throat> of my amateur radio time is on simplex. I talk to my buddies that live within 10 miles of me. Most of, us, most of the time we're using less than 5 watts. Right. Can I do simplex with... with DMR and actually talk radio to radio, or do I have to use a network? Yeah, so here's one of the greatest things is, um, I was hoping there were more people on Simplex here uh, and on Hanfest, and we see it slowly catching on, but I have a slide here on the Simplex channels that you're supposed to use, and there's no reason why you shouldn't be doing that. If you're gonna get 25% more range, I think you make 14652 great again, and you start doing digital Simplex. I don't see any reason with it. I'm gonna have a slide here in a minute. And uh, you can email me, and I'll send you anything you want. Uh, but yeah, I think that's really cool. I think that's cool. You should be using it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Um, you told me there were two ways to call Alaska. That's very important stuff. Uh, yeah. Sorry. God bless you, my son. Okay. So these 13 slides ahead of me. Okay. So one of the best advantages of hotspots, and I'm sorry, I was remiss. Reminded me. If you didn't want to go the repeater route and ask him to put a talk group, which is probably not the best way, you would get a hotspot and you would contact the Atlanta talk group through the Brandmeister server, say, and use a hotspot. 
And I'll talk about that in a minute. That's why I said, remember, there's one great thing about hotspots. It's the flexibility when you travel of being able to connect to any talk group anywhere you are. Remember I said I live in the North Carolina mountains, I don't have an RF pathway. How did I talk into Atlanta Metro? Because I called John Burring at 2 o'clock in the morning when he was drunk and told him to put it on there. And then I went out and got a Shark RF hotspot and put it on because that's the only way I can talk to the network. There's nothing wrong with hotspots. It's how you manage it and how you do it. You know, you should read the manual and learn how it works before you start turning it on. And, and if you're a hotspot manufacturer, you shouldn't ship your hotspots on this amateur radio satellite frequency. You shouldn't do that. Because it makes AWR upset. And, and then it looks bad on VMR, right? That's a true story, by the way. So when you pick your frequency for your hotspot, don't pick it on amateur satellites. You know, they don't like that. Okay. So a lot of this stuff was good stuff. I hope you read it. Please learn how to do your own code plugs. If you learn how to do your own code plugs, you'll actually learn what you're doing. And if you know what DMR is and how it's constructed, you'll get a lot more uh, use and benefit out of it uh, than relying on somebody else, which can get you frustrated because you don't understand how it works. Uh, so, I mean, this is just basic stuff. So, uh, one of the biggest problems I see a lot of people do, you gotta, and I have, I'm the worst violator, you gotta give yourself a couple seconds before you speak. Why you gotta line up all those repeaters and you gotta go through mom and pop internets and whatever. So that's a big thing. The other thing is this morning on Atlanta Metro, I don't mean to embarrass anybody, I have bad etiquette. I was once told that my call sign, I was saying my call sign too fast. K1DMR. He says, he says call sign too fast, I can't get it, I can't make it out. Uh, that's a joke. Uh, but I heard some guy on this morning, he comes on Atlanta Metro, he says, hey, this is Bob, came on, 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 uh, on DMR. So I have a thousand channel Motorola radio, doesn't have more than a thousand, I don't have a two thousand dollar Chinese job, right? I don't have more features, right? And I'm scanning like, you know, kingdom come, and the guy says, I'm driving, so the radio's in a cup holder, right? I can't see the display. And the guy says, I'm Bob, I'm on DMR. More, 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 give me more. So I had no idea where he was, so I couldn't answer him. Because he didn't say, I'm Bob, on Atlanta Metro. And if I was scanning, and the radio was on my hip, and I was scanning, I would have no, I heard somebody call, I'd have no idea where he was. He didn't say Southeast US, he didn't say Georgia Statewide, stuff like that. If you knew how to program your own repeaters, you would know that, and you would learn that. And so that's why you should really, maybe you have somebody help you, and maybe you get an initial code plot from somebody, but learn how to do your own programming, because you'll learn how this stuff works. And you'll learn what talk groups are for, which ones are for this, and which ones are for that. And you wouldn't do something like this. You wouldn't go on North America with 2,000 repeaters. I hear that every day. Once a day, I hear it. CQ, CQ, testing, test. What are you doing? You're laughing, man. You're laughing, I'm just telling you. So these two things here, right? So don't use a wider path if you can use digital simplex in town. Don't do it, because you're turning up a lot of stuff. Leave it for somebody else to enjoy it. And when you need it, then you have the worst power when you need it. If everybody is overusing the worst power, there's no worst power for everybody, okay? And try and find out what the talk group is for, okay? If you want to talk about your colonoscopy and bowel movements and you're retired in Florida, there's an appropriate talk group for that. I'm sure there's one called colon issues, okay? It's talk group colon issues, that's 3174, I'm sure. Okay, but, but just don't do it on the wrong talk group. You think I'm kidding, that's a true story. I mean, it happens a lot. Use the smallest area to support communications. Okay, move to a smaller area. Here's your question. So as soon as you establish contact with somebody, if you're gonna be longer, move to a smaller area, okay? And then CQ, I mean, it's positive, right? You don't wait for solar flares, you don't, I, I, I know who you are. If you keyed up and you had a good connection, I heard you. There's no reason to say CQ. There's no reason to repeat your call sign three times in one minute. No reason to do that. But you do have to say your call sign uh, for FCC purposes because your call sign is not going out digitally. So you're still legally required to once every 10 minutes, right? That's the rule, okay? But you don't have to do it every five seconds because it's not an HF contact where you're in and out. If you've got a good internet connection, every time you key up, it's a positive contact. Hotspots, here we go to you. So, you're not limited to an RF pathway. I told you where I lived in a rural area, many, until I put a portable repeater in my car, I was using hotspots, okay? Uh, 
but you should never use a hotspot over an RF pathway because an RF pathway is more reliable and it has better audio, generally speaking. But if you live in an area not serviced by an RF pathway, and if you're traveling, or if you want to talk, I didn't know if it was your daughter or sister or whoever, and if you had a friend in Alaska and you didn't want to upset the apple cart, that's the only way to go. It's the only way to go. But if you're gonna do it, there's some issues, right? So there was a guy here in Atlanta Metro, nothing wrong with this. He had a hotspot at home, he had a hotspot in his car. He was talking on his hotspot in his car, and then he drives into his driveway at home, and the one at home is working. What's happening now? Okay. The other thing is, he had his 50 watt radio. This is a summation. He had a 50 watt radio right next to his unshielded hotspot. What's happening then? Right. Uh, there's no shielding in it. Right. It's not even a real radio. It's a mimic radio. Right. Uh, and the last thing is, before you get out of the box and put it on amateur satellite frequency. Uh, <laughs> some suggested guidelines here. Um, you want to calibrate the hotspot. All manufacturers have a different way of calibrating it, but understand that the chip in a, in a hotspot is an RF board. It's not a real radio. So we've seen some hotspots off by 12 KC. Okay, so your audio is gonna sound like junk. So check it out, find out what you need to do, get it going, make sure it's right. And there's some limitation on hotspots because people have not been using them correctly. So some of them have just been outlawed restricted which is really a shame. And when you're buying a hotspot, I know this is an amateur thing, the cheapest one is not always the best hotspot. Right, I get that a lot. Well, it was only $79, it was cheaper than any other hotspot. Well, no, not always, okay? So they're not all equal. Some are better than others, and some take less work than others. If you know you don't wanna spend all your life maintaining it and whatever, get one that's more standalone. If you're gonna use external amplifiers, guess what? You can't just grab an external amplifier off the shelf. It has to have a certain amount of fast solid state switching or it won't work on DMR. There's only two amplifiers certified to work with DMR. And you can buy a Chinese one off eBay and there's a couple guys here in Atlanta that swear by the Chinese ones off eBay. But in my opinion, you have a splatter radio that doesn't meet specs. You're putting a splatter amplifier on a splatter radio. Now what are you getting? And you think about this, you buy an amplifier. You buy a speaker mic, you buy a battery eliminator, you buy an external and mag mount, you buy an external antenna. Uh, wouldn't it have been cheaper just to get a mobile? <laughs> and then you've got all these connections. Every time you have to get on a car, you have to disconnect five times. I've tried it for years. I like that notion of being built around a portable. But you know what? It's really not practical, and you're still not going to get the range of a mobile. So just get a mobile. Okay, receive talk groups. You'll use those in Chinese radios because that's just the way they're set up. You shouldn't use them in mobile rural areas. I think you should avoid using them in general if you can. And if you do use them, sorry, if you do use them, be very careful about it because uh, here's what would happen. I don't know what's happening. Uh, how do I go back here? We're going to try and finish up now. Uh, how do I get this thing to go to slideshow? Yeah, I know there's a show. No? Yeah, I know. I don't see it though. I don't know. Slideshow. All right, come on. Come on. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I see file. Home. All right. Where do I go? Custom slide zero. No. I want one slide. Current slide. Second. Is it gonna go back to the one I was on? Wow, man. Okay. So I used to speak uh, all over the world, twenty thousand people at a time, and. Uh, I used to have an interpreter because it was always more impressive to have a big American there and somebody important enough to pay them to translate from English into the native language. And, uh, but uh, she always did the PowerPoint for me too. Uh, okay, so anyways, what's happening with received talk groups are you don't know what you're hearing unless you're looking down at the display. So when you program it, program it, monitor all so you know it could be any talk group that you're hearing uh, and, and pay attention to it because a lot of times you don't know what's going on and people get frustrated because I hear them trying to answer back and they're answering the wrong person back on the wrong talk group. So best practice, you program one repeater per zone and then one talk group per channel. Best practice, if you want to figure out what you're doing and keep on top of what you're doing, that's what you're doing. This is for you back there. Come email me or come uh, stop by the booth. This is what you should be using.
446075 and UHF is the most common for the United States. Here's how you program it. Color code one, time slot one. <laughs> Great thing about DMR is you can go to NetWatch for your repeater and you can see every time you key up what repeater you're on, who you are, how long you talk, how your signal strength was, what network you're on, and what your bit error rate is. If your bit error rate is over 10%, you're not doing too good. You should check your audio quality on Brandmeister hose line, listen to yourself on Parrot, make sure your audio is good. It's irritating to other people if your audio is not good, if it's frustrating for you, please find out, make sure you're doing well. But what's great about this is you can actually see this. If you're running around the car, you can actually you know, have this up and you can see, hey, who was that guy? You know, that kind of thing, kind of cool. Here's an old screenshot, but you can actually go here, put your talk group in, and look at your audio and see if your audio is the proper level and whether or not it, it's sounding clear enough, right? Please do that, check yourself out. Nobody ever does that, and you can tell those that do and those that don't. Okay, there's plenty of stuff coming where you can hook up your cell phone, uh, and we can hook up P25 to DMR, there's plenty of great stuff. I'm using PTT all over cellular now, broadband PTT. Uh, which connects to my cell phone, which could be on a motor turbo talk group or a Motorola talk group or an amateur radio talk group. So plenty of great stuff. Text, email, gateways, all this stuff is, is coming down the pipe. Most of it is available, but hands are starting to integrate it. So just, just kind of crazy stuff. And, and we're done. So you can actually get it on your cell phone and, uh, and be able to talk back anywhere in the world without the hotspot, right? So the last thing I'll leave with this is it's a hobby, have fun. I've said that three times. But the other thing is, try and avoid the pettiness, and try and avoid the politics, right? So if somebody's trying to be helpful, don't snipe them, don't put them down, you don't need to do that. Um, and, and don't try and stir up politics, and don't try and be agitational, try and be friendly, try and, you know, the, the golden rule, treat others as you like to be treated. Um, focus on that, and then I think the fun will come, okay? And then the biggest thing with DMR is, I know it's overwhelming and intimidating, but just get help. There are people like me who will take your call and I'll email you and I'll help you as best I can. And I'm extremely busy. Um, but there are a lot of people that will help if you'll just ask for help. And there's lunch groups and there's Facebook and Yahoo groups. Come to the table, I'll give you all that information. And get plugged in. There are people who love to help and there are people who would love to help you. So give it a try. I've been involved in DMR since 2005, long before Ham's got involved in it. And, and I would tell you it's worth it. Um, it's, it's been a world of difference to me, and most people will tell you the same. Thanks for your time.